So on behalf of the Journal of Clinical Urology, it gives me great pleasure, great uh, pride to introduce the 2007 JCU guest lecture. I, um, Professor Rob Pickard has been a friend of the JCU since it began. He's been on the editorial board since its inception. He's been an active author, a reviewer, a recruiter, and perhaps more than that, he's helped to dictate the direction of travel for the journal. He's helped its development and its evolution into the journal that we have today. And um, that's, of course, just a, a very small aspect of Rob's work over and above his day job. This is basically a list of just a few of the things that Rob has been involved in and has collaborated with. And I think what you can see from that is that there, it's difficult to think of something else in UK urology that I could have put on that list. So Rob's contribution to urology, particularly in the UK, but also uh, beyond the UK, has been unparalleled. It, it has been in, in absolutely massive. And in recognition of that, Rob was awarded the Bowes St. Peter's Medal. And I'll just give you a, a second or two to read what the medal is for. And I think once you've read through that, like me, I suspect you're sat there thinking, you can't really think of a more worthy recipient of the St. Peter's Medal other than Rob Pickard. So I'm really delighted to invite Rob on the stage to give uh, the JCU guest lecture for 2007. And I know that uh, you will enjoy listening to him speak, as we always do. And perhaps afterwards, we might get a chance for questions at the end. So Rob, please come and take a seat. Well, thank you very much, Ian, for the invitation, together with the editorial board of, of the JCU, which I've enjoyed um, supporting over the last um, few years of, its, of Ian, Ian's um, editorship. So, a few months ago when Ian suggested I might like to come and talk today, I asked, what would you like me to speak about? And he said, um, whatever you want. <laughs> So I had to have a think of what I knew about, and it ended up three things. So first of all, I enjoy making marmalade every year for the last 30 years. Um, I've made civil orange marmalade in, in Jan early January, which is something I enjoyed. And if anybody might be interested, I could speak for half an hour on it, but <laughs> I decided not to. The other thing I know a lot about is um, long distance walking. So recently, Caroline, uh, my wife, and me completed the walk between, does this work? Sorry, that's it. Between the south coast of England and the north coast of Scotland. So we've just completed this last section up to um, Dunnet Head, which is the most northerly point of the UK mainland. So I could talk about that, but it involved a lot of pictures of um, countryside, which one or two is all right, but 20 wouldn't be so good. So the only other thing I could think of was um, clinical research. So that's something I've been involved with a lot over the last um, 10 years or so of my uh, career. And something I feel, and this echoes the session um, earlier on this morning, concerning the importance of carrying out clinical research and then translating it into a more um, evidence-based practice. So, I don't know whether it's disappointing to anybody, but I've decided to talk about this rather than marmalade and long distance walking. So first of all, there's a question of why we should do clinical research. And I think it is something that every practicing clinician should think about. And that's not just um, medical clinicians, but also nursing clinicians and other professions, physiotherapists, um, pathologists, you know, should all be thinking about how can research or research of what can make our care better. And it is, in the end, about collecting better knowledge and more precise knowledge of effectiveness and the downsides of treatments that we may offer, and that's both new established treatments and also, sorry, existing established treatments and new technologies 
um, and treatments. And that data is always useful in conversations with patients in terms of making decisions about their care to contrast the alternatives, particularly using outcomes that patients will be um, in, uh, concerned with. And also, because of the rigorous data collection, it also allows some degree of splitting the original population into subgroups to try and individualize the approaches for the patients that are referred to us. And for the NHS, and obviously this is something that's going to require a lot more thought, um, both from clinician point of view, from management point of view, and from the funder, the government point of view, is knowing where to direct the scarce resources that we have available to invest in healthcare in the UK, and knowing, on the other hand, where to remove resources from. And I think that's going to be a major challenge for every clinical specialty. And unfortunately, it, the focus is often on surgical specialties because that's where a lot of the expense um, goes. So it's very important that we have the best knowledge we can of which of our treatments are effective and which may be, could be, or should be abandoned. So in terms of um, who should be involved in clinical research, as, as I say, clinicians, not just medical, but also in um, the nursing profession, physiotherapy profession, all the professions, preferably in, in a team, should be considering um, how research or what research is required to improve care and improve practice. And over the last 10 years or so, there's been a lot of work done centrally in the Department of Health, particularly with Tom Wally and Sally Davis, in terms of developing the infrastructure to conduct and deliver research within the NHS, because the NHS is such a fantastic organization to allow research to be, to be done in. And that's responded in a lot of secondary care institutions organizing themselves into developing local research teams allied to research and development departments. And, you know, it's become, really is core business of, of the NHS, irrespective of the size of the unit. And part of that has been organizing researchers into national research networks within the umbrella of the NIHR. Um, working in, often in conjunction with the university departments that provide expertise in terms of conducting robust clinical research and coming and making sure the results are going to be believable by, by the um, community, whether that's patients or clinicians. And then finally, at the top of the list there is patient and lay groups. And pay, lay members of the public and patients are often very keen to be involved in research and one of the key things they can do is to set the research priorities that are most, are most concerned to them. So particularly this morning we heard about um, some NHS organisations that have a particular focus in research and that is mirrored in this sort of league table of where clinical research is being done in the NHS. So there is a, an intention or a wish, if you like, that all NHS organizations should be involved in research. And you can see from this list on the left that um, it's all the usual suspects, if you like, who are on top of the league tables. And sometimes that's, that's obviously a good thing, particularly for those trusts, because they get a lot of their incomes, you get a good income stream from carrying out NIHR portfolio research, and this is ranked according to the um, number of studies that are open um, and also the number of patients um, recruited. And the downside of that, that, you know, it suggests to other organizations that these big guys are doing all the work, all the research and getting the, the value from it, which then feeds into clinical care in smaller organizations, particularly driven by guidance. But it's important to realize that it's not just those big um, tertiary centers who are doing all the work. There's a lot of recruitment to trials going on in smaller, organi smaller NHS organizations. So it's, you know, and that's 
just as valuable proportionally as one that's going on in big organizations. So it's very important to realize that the majority of NHS secondary care units do have a research, clinical research infrastructure that urologists or any other specialty can buy into and um, be part of by recruiting on to, into trials. So getting involved, well, there, there are lots of different ways that clinicians can get involved. And you know, as, as I said at the beginning, it is part of the imperative of our work, I would feel, are in, you know, and part of being a professional that you should be contributing to driving the improvement in care by using the most effective treatments in the most efficient way. So the NHR welcomes ideas. You know, they've been allocated quite a considerable amount of ring-fenced money and it's been preserved for the next five-year cycle, so at least another four years uh, left of, um, of funding for the NIHR. And they, on their website, you can um, submit research ideas, preferably with a backing of a systematic review, which is ideally a Cochrane review, but that is a lot of work, so um, a more narrative kind of review without meta-analysis is also acceptable, particularly if it um, signals research priorities. And if you can back that up with research priorities suggested by patient organizations, then that is even more powerful that research might be commissioned in the area. I think it is important to, because we all get hung up on the way of doing things, and I think that was illustrated by Jim Cato's talk this morning, that that dogma is actually different in different departments, even though people you know, are meant to be treating the same thing, is that it can be done in lots of different ways. And trying to challenge the feeling that's what's always been done, we should um, continue it, is very important. And the other thing that was emphasized this morning was a team approach, and I think that is very important. Obviously, some individuals are, have skills in leading a research, but part of those skills is infusing a team of people, including um, university departments, such as clinical trials units, in terms of um, getting research done. And probably from our point of view, that is also means infusing a lot of urologists to, contri to recruit to, to trials. Research must be feasible. So it's important that you have as sound a basis as possible to say what you feel should be done is able to be done in a time, timely manner. And then, you know, if you want to go the whole hog, then you can write a protocol for your research idea. And um, there are, within the NIHR, um, researcher-driven lines of funding. So what I've, I've mainly been involved in is so-called pragmatic trials. So these are trials where you've got a bit of knowledge of effect size, which is usually small or moderate. In other words, quite uncertain. There's no point doing large RCTs when the effect size is, is very high. Um, it's, you, it should be inclusive, so you need wide inclusion criteria. You want to include as many um, types of patients as possible to show generalizability. And the question has to be a reasonable high value. So answering the research question has got to give benefit both in terms of patient care, in terms of patient well-being, and also in terms of spending um, limited resources. At the moment, this is mainly, um, in, mainly RCTs that provide robust evidence. And they, the RCT methodology still hasn't been seriously challenged by any alternative methodologies. So even though it might seem quite a faff to get going, it is, it is the evidence that is recognized um, throughout both by um, providers of healthcare and by clinicians and by patients. Um, in pragmatic trials, um, it's important that pathways of cares aren't disruptive because if you have to completely disrupt a pathway of care, 
it makes recruitment um, very difficult. It is possible, um, but it is much more difficult. So the least disturbance to the current pathways of NHS care, apart from the random allocation of treatment options or intervention options, and collecting outcomes from both patients and other data, you know, that should be, that should be minimized as far as possible. And to compensate for the wide inclusion criteria, you do need a large sample size. So a lot of these um, studies do recruit 500 um, plus uh, patients, which is obviously quite onerous. So the benefits, and this is illustrated by um, the SUSPEND study, is immediate translation into clinical practice, because everybody can see that the type of patients included in a pragmatic trial mirror the patients they're seeing in their clinical practice. And because of that, it provides the backbone of evidence-based um, clinical guidance, both within the UK and wider afield in, in Europe and other um, countries with developed medical um, care systems. And it's important to realize that if no effect is found, as was in suspend, that information is often as valuable as a significant difference because it does allow you to carry out this disinvestment in treatments that aren't um, causing any benefit to, to patients or to other aspects of healthcare. It is challenging though, um, so RCTs are expensive, um, so you need a funder. Um, the funding comes from um, various sources, but mainly in the UK from the NIHR. Interestingly, another group of um, clinicians, the trainees, have been doing some very large sample cohort studies without any funding. So the Trainee Collaborative in the UK has carried out um, a study looking at markers of stone passage um, with short follow-up, uh, widespread um, involvement, and they managed to recruit 4,500 patients in a relatively short period of time. So that might be one possible challenger to RCTs, that if you can get cohort studies of sufficient numbers of people, then you can answer some of these questions in a much uh, less expensive way. One of the other challenges is getting through clinical trial regulations. So this has improved, um, but every improvement means a change, which means extra work trying to get to know the new system. And that's certainly the case with the new human uh, research authority and the increasing interest of the MHRA as well as drugs now moving into uh, devices as well. Um, probably the least tricky one is the ethical ethics approval. Um, that's become very streamlined and relatively straightforward. And then linked to the NHS approval, which is now through the Health, Authori Health Research Human Research Authority, is finding sites to do research. So these large, high sample size studies often require a large number of sites to generate the recruitment that's required to achieve the sample size in a relatively timely manner, which is usually two to three years. So trials that need more than two to three years to recruit, um, you know, it's, you've got to be absolutely certain that you're going to have a valuable answer at the end of it. And that is probably the main challenge of all trials, um, is recruiting participants to the target that you planned and the time, the recruitment time that you had allowed. And it is difficult to keep enthusiasm going over two to three years, but because the rewards in terms of the answer, in terms of benefit to NHS patient care, and also other incentives, either personal, career, or financial through trust. You know, it is, it is possible to keep um, trials on track, but does require quite a lot of work. 
So I mentioned recruitment is um, one of the biggest issues. So these are the two trials I've been involved in recently. So um, this one did pretty well. We only, this is the um, target line of recruitment, and this is the actual line. So we just needed another three or four months um, to get our recruitment up to the required sample size. So that was relatively straightforward. This one, which is comparing open urethroplasty against urethrotomy, um, was a lot more challenging through a number of um, issues, particularly involving the, care, the pathway of care in the NHS and the changes in NHS waiting times, particularly between the heady days of um, the late um, first decade of the 21st century and then the more recent years where resources has been, budgeting has been very tight. But we got there in the end, so that required um, a year's extension to the recruitment um, period. But both successfully um, recruited in the end. So how can, you, how can everybody get involved? So as I say, it is important that as many people get involved as possible. Um, submitting research ideas, and this is ideally within the context of a group, either a clinician group or um, patient groups advised by um, clinicians. So that they can be um, submitted to the NIHR, who would then, if they feel it's a goer, would um, commission a vignette somebody to write a vignette to um, describe the research that was required. The other important one is acting as a PI. So as I showed on the slide of lists of the NHS trusts, even if you're working in a relatively small secondary care organization, that organization will have a clinical research team that you can tap into to recruit to trials that you're interested in either hearing about them or looking up on the NHIR portfolio. The other way is getting involved, and this is obviously best done through the BOWS sections, so getting involved in applications that are going on. And I think a very important one is to help the trainee network, so they're the future. And Veru and before him, Ben Lam, have done a lot of work to infuse a network of trainees to actually deliver uh, recruitment to their chosen trials. So here's one, here's a current opportunity you might like to investigate. So it's run by um, my uh, colleague, Chris Harding. And this is the clinical trials unit at Newcastle. So again, um, this is a trial of methanamine against antibiotic prophylaxis for women with recurrent UTIs. And the target recruitment is in blue and the actual recruitment is in red. So already there's a bit, of a, a bit of a lag that needs to be improving. So those of you already recruiting this trial, we need a recruitment upswing, or else if you're interested in becoming a site, then um, Chris would be delighted to hear from you, I'm sure. So that's called the ALTA trial, so you can look that up on their website. So that's me finished, and I can return thankfully to uh, my retirement, both by m making marmalade and planning our next um, long distance walk. So again, thank you very much, Ian, for the invitation. Thank you all for listening. I hope it was worth it. <laughs> I think we might have uh, time for this. Anyone got any questions at all for Rob? Good question. Rob, can I just ask you a quick question? I know that um, we're about out of time, but do you think that we are seeing a decline in the bias in terms of publications of positive compared to negative results for, for trials? Yeah, I think um, particularly the Lancet has been a champion of pragmatic trials and the realisation that uh, finding no signal, no effect, particularly in trials of known and well-used treatments, is as important as finding uh, a positive effect. You know, obviously for new treatments, if 
there's no signal of any effect, then you've got, as was explained this morning, you've got to look at the harms, you know, to see if there's any other advantages of, of new treatment. And that obviously applies particularly to new technology. Rob, again, thank you very much for making the trip up. I'm sorry you didn't bring any marmalade for us to try, no, but yeah. uh, maybe next year. Yeah. Thank you again. Thanks. Okay.